All righty. Good evening, everyone. And once again, we're continuing our studies of the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Friendship. And we're in Luke chapter 15. And we're going to cover tonight this idea of was lost and is found. And I apologize in advance. I'm fighting a cold, so you'll probably notice I sound a bit uh, underwater. And you guys will uh, hear. My hearing is a bit funny, so you, you'll probably, when we're talking later, sound like you're underwater to me. So we want to cover this idea of what is uh, lost and is found. And we're going to spend the bulk of, of tonight in chapter 15 and try to stay as much as we can in, in this chapter, because there's an awful lot in Luke chapter 15. And if you could turn to it. Now, Luke 15 is unique to Luke. None of the parables that we have in this in this chapter uh, are found anywhere outside of Luke's gospel. So again, you know, when we think of our, our themes and our the message of Luke's gospel, this is something that Luke has deliberately chosen to include that others did not pick up and use. And so we need to have that in the forefront of our mind as we we consider these things uh, this evening. Now our goal is to focus on these ideas of are we aware of what is lost and how much do we value what is gone missing and and how we can apply this to our lives and and you know to be able to view this through theophilus's eyes and what would he have taken from this but also for us as friends of god as theophilus's what is the message for us to consider where we look at these very special parables. Now, as far as the structure of, of Luke chapter 15, I think it's important for us to see that there's a lot going on in this chapter and it's interconnected and interwoven and it's very deliberate in its structure. And I would love to be able to show this kind of thing for all of the chapters in Luke, but I'm not there yet. I'm sure that there are these interweavings uh, that are as simple in, in some ways to connect the dots to in the other chapters, and we've kind of bubbled along so far. Uh, but this chapter, I think, shows us how things are laid out very deliberate. If, if we were in any doubt, here's a great chapter where we've got three parables. They're all about lost, and yet there's more it meets the eye. So what we're looking at there is we've got the parable of the sheep on the left-hand side, and then we've got the parable of the coins or the lost coin. And then we've got a parable which sits within this purple box that is commonly known as the prodigal son. The first thing I would like to put forward to you in keeping with Luke's patterns of four is that there is actually four lost in this chapter. There's the sheep that is lost, there's the coin, and that there are two sons that are, are equally lost. And, and I hope that with this chart, we'll, we'll start to see that, that is a, there's a lot of deliberate choices being made. So. One of the things that, you know, the parables should be very familiar to us. So just quickly jumping over the details, we should be aware that the, the sheep is lost outside the house. So we've got this focus on what is outside. The coin is lost in the house, and it makes it clear to us when we look at the details that it's lost in the house. When we get to the parable of the prodigal son, as we call it, the younger son gets lost outside the house. He goes out and he, he goes into a, a, in a far off land. And so he's, he goes away and he finds himself lost. We also then are introduced to the, to the eldest son who's lost, as it were, in the house. He's still there, he remains there, but he's just as lost. And we need to think about the, the structure of that. So we've got something lost outside, something lost inside, something lost outside, something lost inside. And I think Christ deliberately places these ideas and these parables in a row 
because of the audience that he's, he's speaking to, and we'll, we'll come back to, to Luke chapter 15 and look at the, the introduction of these things. Um, you can see that there's uh, some kind of pattern going on with, with the number of lost things in relation to that which is, in a sense, found or is still known as to where it is. So the parable of the sheep, we've got um, one out of out of a hundred, and it makes it very deliberate. You have a hundred sheep, and you lose one, and leaving the ninety and not, and and so a lot talk about this idea of one out of a hundred. It's a much larger group that that is being referred to in this parable of the of the sheep. When we get to the coin, we go from a, a ratio of one out of a hundred down to one out of ten, and so there must be some deliberate. Yeah, you know, reduction, where one coin is lost out of ten inside the house. When we get to the to, to the parable of the sons, if you take the point that's been made so far that both of them are lost, then then all is lost. It's two out of two. If you want to say that, well, the eldest son is not lost, and you want to hold to that view, then we still see that it's a one out of out of two or fifty percent. And so there's this deliberate narrowing down, and we have to think, well, what, what is that about? Why is this there as we go through this? Now, when you look at uh, the action that's taken in order to recover that which is lost, it's interesting that it says that the sheep, that he goes out, he leaves the night and night, and he goes searching. So that's what I mean by goes out to find him. He leaves where he's at and he actually goes somewhere else. With the coin, it says that she she lit a candle and she swept the house. And so the action is still, in a sense, contained within the house. She's within, like, say, the boundaries of the home or the property. With the younger son, it's interesting that the father waits and watches. He doesn't leave the property. He doesn't go to the far off land. He doesn't do that in his search for the younger son. And so the parallel that you would you would say is going on here between sheep and younger son parables seems to, to break type. And yet then with the eldest son, it makes a point that says that the father had to go out from the house. and had to go out to meet his eldest son outside the house because he refused to come in and so like the shepherd he has to then go out to meet the eldest son and i think there is a deliberate flipping of things there to help us see that there are two lost in that one parable because there's an action that mirrors the the both the parables of the coin and the and the sheep in these types the other thing that is striking is that the sheep and the coin parables, besides obviously having something that's lost, share a common uh, re repeat where it says that they call their friends and their neighbors. You'll notice that if you look at uh, Luke 15, uh, verse 6, and then if you come down to verse 9, both call friends and neighbors. Now, the word neighbors there is what we would normally think of the word neighbor, as in this is the word that means, that's used so rare in the scripture, of someone who lives next door, whose property adjoins yours. Uh, that's this word neighbor. And so it's interesting that the, the, the sheep and the coin both have similar references to people who are not part of the household who are coming and are being invited to share in this, this celebration, where with the, the prodigal son parable, or the lost sons, as I like to refer to it, it's interesting that those who are in attendance to the feast are those who make up the household. They're, obviously, the two sons are invited, and the father's there, and the servants are there. And so we have those within the house. And so, again, there seems to be some deliberate crossing over and joining of things in order for us to see these patterns and these lessons that are being interwoven um, as we consider these parables. You'll also notice that in all four 
situations, there is a call to rejoice. So the, the, the friends and the neighbors are called to rejoice uh, with both the, the shepherd and the woman. And then the father tells the servants that we need to rejoice because the, the younger son has returned. And then he goes out and he speaks to the younger, uh, the eldest son and says, we should rejoice. We should make merry. And I always put a question mark here at the end. The invitation to rejoice is consistent. Whether the eldest son joins in, we're, we're, we're not told. The, the, the parable ends with, a, a, in a sense, us questioning, well, what does the, the eldest son do from here? Does he heed his father's advice and join in the celebrations within the house, or does he stay outside moping and sulking? But what is consistent that across all four lost is this, uh, this invitation to rejoice in the experience of, of, of having something that is lost and that is found. And so we do have that, that common connection that runs through all of them. I hope that helps to, to see how they're interconnected and interwoven and that there's these deliberate flips and flops now, one of the questions that I think is important to ask, we've made this point that there's fours, you know, there's four dinners in the chapter before, there's four Elijahs in, in chapter nine, that Luke loves to play with these ideas of fours. Why not four parables? It would stand to reason that you would present a lost sheep, a lost coin, a lost younger son, and say a lost older son in a separate parable. And yet this, if you take the point that there are four lost things, it's interesting that these four lost things are contained in only three parables. And I think that's deliberate. When we think about this purple box, it is the, the intertwining of the lessons of the, the sheep and the coin. And I think that it's deliberate that the, the these parables of the lost end with one parable that takes two separate parties and weaves them together into, into one parable about both being lost. And therefore they share something in common. The younger son and the eldest son, whether they realize it or not, are connected in their struggle, in their ability to, to, to find their way. And I think that that's important when we go back to, to verse one. So if you you got Luke 15, can you go back to the introduction of these parables? Because the, the context of the parables are people who are seeing themselves as separate. So if you're there in, in Luke chapter uh, 15 and verse one, it says, they drew near unto him all, uh, all, the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Now, certainly it wasn't all of them. We couldn't fit them all in one space, but it's interesting that there's this all encompassing terminology used. And they were they were brought near. And so this is this idea of, of, of coming together. And yet there's a separation because the Pharisees and the scribes, they murmur and they see themselves as separate. Now, it's interesting that they're all together in this space. So the, the Pharisee and the scribe find themselves in the same location, in the same, as it were, house, where all of this is taking place. They're all the same location. It's not, oh, we heard that you did this. They're witnessing it. So they're a party to this, but they're a part. And I think the reason that the last parable has two lost combined into one parable is to join these two parties, to bring the publican and the sinner and the Pharisees and the scribes together into one, as it were, family unit, and to actually understand and appreciate the struggles that they're having. Now, you'll notice at the bottom of the screen that there's this play with the ideas of nearness throughout this chapter. So we've got then drew near unto him all the publicans. So that's that idea of drawing near, or that that word near, is a different word than 
used in verse 25 and verse 28. They're all interesting in their significance, but they're all got a shared sort of sense of closeness. So we've got publicans and sinners trying to get close. The word there for close or near means to exist as in to be present. So this is the idea that they were they were near in the sense that they were actually there. They were present for to hear him. They had fronted up. So that's the idea of near in, in verse one. When you come down to verse 25, when the eldest son comes from the field, and so he's he's still part of the household, it's still on the property, but he isn't in the house. And it says when he came near or drew nigh to the house, and there's that theme of the house again that Luke's playing with, that means physically he approached. He physically drew near, but emotionally he's not there. And we know that from verse 28, because when it says that he was angry and would not go in, therefore came out, uh, came his father out and entreated him. The word entreat there also carries this idea of, of nearness. It means to call someone or beckon someone, to invite someone to be near, to, to come alongside. So you get this image in verse 28 that the father went out because his son was deliberately not getting near. Just like the Pharisees and the scribes wouldn't draw near to the public and sinners. And it says that he had to actually say to his son, come here, son. And you can almost see the image of a father sitting down on the front steps of the house. And his son is out there pacing around, probably ranting to himself or whatever. And the father says, come here, son, sit down, sit down next to me. I want to talk to you. And so there's a lot going on in this idea of, of trying to bring these parties together. Because the they saw these people as sinners, and, and that's how the eldest son sees the younger as a sinner. And we've already talked about this idea of publicans and sinners, that sinners, as, as we're probably familiar with, are people who miss the mark. So they're aiming for something and they, they can't seem to find it. And it just, it, it misses. Publicans, we know, are tax collectors, but the word actually comes from the idea in the Greek of someone who goes for a goal and gets it. They're goal getters. So it's interesting that they share a commonality in the sense that one aims for something and misses, the other one aims for something and hits it. It's just that what the publican in the sense is aiming for, he ought not to be. What the sinner is aiming for, he can't seem to find. You know, and, and we've got that lovely sort of Dr. Susi set of verses in Romans chapter seven, you know, the good that I would do, I don't do. That which I would not, that do I. That's the publican and the sinner. The person who aims and misses and the person who aims and hits. And these Pharisees, they don't see themselves falling into that category. And they say, you know, this man, he receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Now it's worth noting this word receiveth. Can you come back to Luke chapter uh, two? We're just going to stay in Luke. I just want to show you how this word receiveth is used because we would think, I guess if we were to translate it into our own sort of speak, we would say this man, when we say receives, what do we mean? Extends invitations to, allows to be a part of his, his social group. What does it actually mean to receive sinners? You know, like we we think of like you know you, you receive a package in the post. What is this idea of receiving sinners? Well, he, it's used uh, in Luke chapter two and verse twenty five in this way. It says, "And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout." waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. The word waiting there is the word receiveth. 
Now, if you come down a few verses into chapter 2, verse 38, you have a very similar set of phraseology, and it, the same word is used. Uh, Luke 2, 38, and she coming in the instant, this is Anna, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Look for is the word receiveth or waiting. So somebody who looks for sinners, someone who is waiting for sinners, could be a way of translating uh, this phrase in Luke 15. Uh, on your way back to Luke chapter 15, can you stop in at Luke chapter 12? In Luke chapter 12, coming down to verse 35, it says, Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord. That word wait there. When he will return for the wedding, then when he cometh and knocketh, it, uh, they may open unto him immediately. We've got that sort of allusion to the parable of, of the, the ten virgins that Matthew records for us in chapter 25. But again, it's this idea of waiting for the Lord. And, and so far, those verses are all focused, as we see it, on the, on the kingdom, on Christ's coming. Come down, the, the last one is in Luke chapter uh, 23, in verse 51. It's talking about uh, Joseph. It says, the same had not consented. I believe that's Joseph. Is it Joseph? Let me just double check. It's not good when your notes don't give you the context. Luke chapter 23. And verse 51. Yes, verse 50. And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. The same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. Now, that word waited there is also this idea of receiveth. So if we were to take that as the predominant translation of the word, we would see it as this man waits for sinners and eats with them. And so when we think about our understanding of, of what it means to follow Christ, to be a friend of God, this is to wait for sinners. Wait for what? And I think as we, we look at the parables as they unfold, the parable of the, of the prodigal son, as, as we understand it, the prodigal son, you recall, he, he, it says when he came to himself, he realized he was better off at his father's house. That's what these publicans and sinners are doing. It says that they drew near unto him, all the publicans and sinners. Why? To hear him. They wanted to listen, like Mary, who sat at Jesus' feet, who, who Christ said, one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, was to hear the word of the Lord. And so this is what Christ did, is he, he waits for sinners to wake up to themselves. And that's hard. It's very hard in a world where everything is is solved in a sitcom in 30 minutes that we we live in a microwave you know gotta have it now two minute noodle world we don't have the patience to wait for anyone and yet we certainly want to be waited on so it's interesting what is is meant by this idea of of receiving sinners the other thing that should cause us to think is if we go in the other direction because the words in the actual Greek, the way that it's translated, means to receive to oneself, to admit, or to give access to oneself. So it's this idea of admitting into your presence. It doesn't seem to have in the Greek the idea of time. Yet the way it's used elsewhere in Luke, we think, oh, it's about waiting around and sitting there kind of marking time. But the actual Greek means to actually 
bring them into yourself, to admit them into your company, into your friendship circle. You know, in, in this language of this day, we would we would friend them. It's interesting how that word is has become so empty and meaningless in the age that we live in. I was defriended. I would suggest that our idea of friendship has been warped drastically, particularly in the age of social media, because we draw people near, but we never actually get close. And yet this man it says that he receives sinners. When we spin that on its head, it makes us think of the verses we just looked at. And so what is actually meant for that they waited for the consolation, that they looked for redemption? Were they sitting there looking at their watch? Or should we look at those verses rather as this idea of that they brought into their company? They, they made the kingdom of God part of their circle. They had brought them near. They brought the kingdom of God into where it could access their heart. Now, that would also explain why they're described as just and devout. It wasn't something that they were thinking about. Well, when we get there, then we'll change. It was something that they brought into here. And it changed them. It's, it's just interesting to consider which way should we read this, this word and understand it. Either way, it should cause us to reflect and, and think deeply about how we are waiting for the kingdom and how we are waiting for sinners. What does that actually really mean when the rubber hits the road? Uh, I'd like to offer you this as a memory tool. Okay. So we know that this, uh, like a bookend in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, where it says, The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. And this chapter says, That which is lost. And so we've got this idea of lost things coming back to us in, in chapter 19. The memory tool I want to offer you is to, as far as how to understand the, the pieces of these, these parables in Luke 15, is this word avail. So we know it's an old word and we, we don't use it to avail ourselves of something, is to make use of. So I, I hope you will make use of this, not just in, in an academic way of understanding the parables, but in a very practical way, because otherwise it's totally useless. But as far as like our to-do list, as far as dealing with that which is lost, the word avail there taken out of James chapter 5, verse 16, which we'll come back to later on, says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And I'd like you to ascribe, if you're taking notes, that to each letter of the, the word avail, that veil stands for A, awareness, V, value, the next A, action, the I is information, and the, the L stands for love. And I, I hope to demonstrate that to you uh, right now. When we look at these par parables with the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost sons, it makes it clear that the first thing is that they're aware that something is missing. So if you go back to Luke chapter 15, go back to Luke 15 and come down to verse 3. It says, sorry, verse 4, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? Obviously, the shepherd is there and he's counting heads and he, wait a minute. Imagine how frustrating that would be if you had to try to get up to a hundred and you're like 96, 97. Wait a minute, someone just interrupted me. Where was I? The sheep keep moving. I mean, I'm a school teacher and we go on excursions and things like that. And we are all constantly counting heads. You count everybody onto the bus, 
you count everybody on the bus, you count everybody as they get off the bus, you count everybody all day long, making sure that no one's gone missing because you can't really come home from an excursion with one missing and go, you know, 99, that's not bad. I mean, when you think about it, one out of 100, I mean, you're about to lose one. I mean, list, it's not two. I mean, try to imagine trying to explain that to a parent when they come to collect their kids and you say, hey, I had 100 and I only lost one. Yeah, it's pretty good. You know that you're, this one matters as much as any of them. And so you're constantly trying to be aware, and a shepherd would be aware. The lost point, the woman is aware that what is missing. She has 10 pieces of silver, and now she's got nine, and she's going to do something about it. Now, when you talk about the lost thuds, he's obviously aware that something is missing. Because the youngest one comes, and he says, I want what I deserve in the inheritance. And you think, well, that would be a bit of an indication that there's something going on. He also seems to be aware that his other son, his eldest son, is not happy and won't come in. And I would suggest that he's aware of the, all of the dynamics of his two boys long before the question is even asked as to Where's the money, Dad? And he's thought about what is he going to do when this comes to a head? And what decision is the right one? Because he could have easily said to the younger son, no. You'll get your inheritance when I'm dead. End of conversation. And that's a choice that could have been made, but it wasn't. And we've got to think, why? Why did the father just stop his youngest son in his tracks and say, no. Nope. I think he was aware of lots of things. Because if he had said that, I mean, imagine if, if, if one of our, our brethren came to us on Sunday morning and said, yeah, Billy's Billy's not coming anymore. And you go, oh, what's what's the matter? Is he he's sick or what? No, no, he's he's packed his bed. He's gone. Where's he gone? How's he gone? Oh, he asked me for his inheritance, and I I wrote him a check. And next morning he was gone. How many of us would think you're a fool? If you didn't give him any money, he'd still be at home because he's got no no money, no income, nothing to go fritter away. He should have just said no. Imagine if he had said no. You could have it when I'm cold, dead, and buried in the ground. When he went off into that far off land and he came to himself and he went, Oh man, I've been I've been stupid. I need to go home. Because, you know, in my brother's house it wouldn't have been dad's anymore. In my brother's house, the servants are treated better than this. And when he got to the gate of now his brother's house, what kind of reception do you reckon he would have got there? With no father to, to welcome him. Do you see, I think the father is acutely aware of what's going on and he's made the wisest decision based on what he is aware of because while he's alive he could do something to help both boys but when he's dead he won't be able to help either boys and so awareness is key can you come over to, to proverbs chapter 27 In Proverbs chapter 27, we have this lovely word of advice. And when we think about our parable of the lost sheep here, it says, 
Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds. Now, the word state there is the word face. It's used, it's translated in Proverbs chapter uh, 27 and verse uh, 19 as face. So if you just go back to Proverbs, just go back a few verses in Proverbs to verse 19, what you've got there is in verse 19, it says, as water, as in water face answereth to face, so the heart of man to man. So that's that word state. So when it says, be thou diligent to know the state, it's saying, know the face of thy flock. Now, how does one get to know the face of one's flock? It's that relationship, isn't it? It's what this whole gospel is trying to teach us, is that we need to get closer, close enough that we can see each other's face. I deal with a lot of, of children. And as a school teacher, you can imagine that not everything that you have to say to children, they want to hear. And they're not always sure why you would say that. And what is your motives? One of the tricks that I've found very helpful, and it only works if your motives are actually genuine. Is you say, I just want you to stop and I want you to look in my eyes as I say this. And I want you to tell me what my eyes are saying to you. Because our eyes betray us. They're the windows to the soul, they say. And if our eye is not singular, it'll be full of darkness and people will see it. This is why lots of people won't look at you when they lie. Because they know that their eyes will betray them. And so when you want to say something and you want people to actually be able to, to tell, invite them, invite them close to know the state of your face so that they might decide whether you are interested in their face. And when they see in your eyes that you actually genuinely care they won't worry so much about how it's said or what's said because they'll know that you actually care because as face answers to face, so the heart of man to the man. That's what we're told in this chapter. Now, when it says to look well to your herds, the word, the words there, it's two words. It means to consider the heart. So in Proverbs 24, verse 32, it's translated, Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. And you get the sense there, because of the repetition, to consider it well, I looked upon it. So you've got, I saw, I considered, I looked. That it's, it's not a passing glance. And when we talk about look well to your herd, it's to look and to look and to look and to really look. It, this idea of, of consider well, the wellness of it, side of it, the heart, is used in Proverbs 27, verse 9, where it talks about ointment and perfume, rejoice the heart. That's that word to look well. So it's actually translated heart there in verse 9 of Proverbs 27. And it's interesting that how that verse goes on. It says, ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. That our, 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 our whole countenance is lifted when we have a friend who will actually come and speak to us heart to heart. We use that sort of expression, I need to talk to you heart to heart. We need to have a heart to heart. And we avoid those conversations at our peril. We need to have the difficult conversations. 
And we need to sit down and think about what is it that we're actually wanting to achieve. Now that we're aware that something's missing, now what? So we've, we've looked, we've considered, we've drawn close, and now we see something. Instead of burying our head in the sand, we're actually looking. Now what do we do? Well, when we go back to, the, to Luke chapter 15, what we see is that there's this tremendous value placed on that which is missing. So I know this is missing. Now what do I do? Well, how much value is it? How much value is it to you? And, and how much value could it be to you? Might be a more important question. Because the shepherd doesn't go, eh, it's just one out of a hundred. There's plenty more where that came from. He doesn't have that response any more than the school teacher could say that about a lost student. Ah, there's plenty more where that comes from. Oh, I won't have to mark that paper when I, you know, they're his assignments anymore. When you look at the woman, it says that she lit a candle and swept. Now, I, I want to focus on this lighting of a candle for a moment because in our day and age where we flick on a light and boom, it's instant, lighting a candle took effort and energy both to do it and cost. There was oil that needed to be expended that had value. So how much is this piece of silver worth to this woman? It's worth the expenditure of the fuel in the candle. Yeah, when you think of our day and age, if we dropped a coin on the ground, we would go, it's not worth our time to bend down and pick up the change that often falls out of our pocket, let alone to expend costly fuel, like the light of a candle, in order to, to search it. So she saw tremendous value in it. There's all kinds of speculation as to what this, this silver represents. And I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in going down the speculative side of things. What we do know is she valued it. Why she valued it, we're not told, and the scripture doesn't give us any indication that I'm aware of, of what these coins could be. There's a lot of tradition as to what they could be, but the scripture doesn't. All it tells us is it was worth lighting a candle for. And that's enough. When you look at this idea to light a candle, it's, it's a very unique phrase. The word light there, as in to light a candle, is only used in Luke's gospel. So it's a rare word. It's only used four times of which this is one. In all of the scripture, and only in Luke's gospel. So if you're in Luke 15, verse uh, 8, when it says, doth not light a candle and sweep the house, this means to set on fire. And it comes from the idea to fasten or to adhere to. It was something that, that, that was attached. It attached to the candle. It's used in Luke 8, verse 16, where it says, No man hath, uh, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth with a vessel. In other words, you don't light candles unless you want them to give light, unless you want it to illuminate. It's used again, and we've already looked at this book again, in Luke uh, 11, verse 33, about no man lighting a candle, put it in a secret place. That they which come in, they see the light. And there's all kinds of parable, uh, parallels that we could, we could draw. There's all kinds of things that we could, we could touch on about this idea of light. But think of the value that she places on this coin. Uh, the last reference, and I would, would like us to turn this up, is in Luke 22. Because I think it's, it's interesting if you want to find a place where this parable is played out of the lost coin. Come over to Luke chapter 22. This is the last time that it's used in Luke's gospel or in the scripture, this word light. Luke 22, verse 54, it says, Then took they him and led him, this is Jesus, and brought him into the high priest's house. So Christ finds himself 
in the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. So you've got this idea that he's not near. And when they had kindled a fire, and that's that word to light a candle, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall, so it says, and we were sat down together, Peter sat down among them. So Peter's falling afar off, and he comes nigh to this lit fire, like the candle drawing people to its light. And what happens when he gets there? Another woman, a certain maid, it says, beheld him as he sat by that fire and earnestly looked upon him. She looked and she looked and she looked. And you actually get the sense from the Greek that it was like she, she got closer and closer and she was staring at him. Staring at this bed. She said this bed was also with him. And he denied it, saying, Woman, I know not. I know him not. Isn't it interesting that when this is used elsewhere in Luke's gospel, you've got this lost coin. You've got Peter and he's lost. And there's a light that's attracted him. And he's swept up. And he's tumbling about. And this woman searches him. But he doesn't like it. He didn't want to be found. Peter was a lost coin of the house, not wanting to be found by, the, by that woman. Not found out then. Now, when you look at the parable, if you come back to Luke 15, about the parable of the of the, the two sons, it says he divided unto them his living. So he it doesn't say he gave the younger son his portion. It says he gave unto them his living. So the value he placed on these two sons was all that he has. And that's stressed later on in Luke chapter 15 because it says, all that I have, you remember when he comes out and he speaks to, to the eldest son, he says, all that I have, this is down in verse 31, son, thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine. Because all that was left, he had given to this son, because the other portion had already been expired, expended. And so he says, all that I have is yours. That's the value that the father places on these two boys. His entire living. Makes us think of the woman, the woman with her, her two bites that she cast in all her living. And she had cast in more than all of them who had cast in of their abundance into the treasury. You don't need to turn to it. We, we looked at the Good Samaritan, but I just want to call your, your mind back to, to Luke chapter 10 with the Good Samaritan because we see a similar scenario there. It says that when he had saw him, and, and we, we noted that all of them saw him, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, they all saw the man who fell among thieves. What tells us that he valued him was it says he had compassion on him. It tells us that he would pay for his care. There was a cost both in his heart and in his pocketbook for this individual. And you'll see there, it goes on to talk about the actions he took, the information that he shared, and the love that he showed. And, and, and so the Good Samaritan follows a similar pattern in its, its uh, uh, breakdown. If you're still in Luke chapter 15, though, you'll notice that when the prodigal son returns in verse 20, 
the father has the same special ingredient that the good Samaritan had. Verse 20 of Luke 15, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You see that compassion is still the key ingredient. It's the thing that the Pharisees and the scribes in verses one and two lacked. It's what the Samaritan had. It's what the father had. It's what the eldest son was missing. That's what was lost. If you're wondering what was lost about the eldest son, he had lost compassion. We need to examine ourselves and ask, have we lost compassion? Is that why we're not aware anymore? We don't want to see because we don't want to feel because we don't want to act. It's something for us to think about. Um, very quickly, uh, you've got some verses there. It's worth jotting down. We know that in Luke, this idea of value has already been spoken of. In Luke chapter uh, 12, verse 7, he said, you know, that we're not to fear because we're of more value than many sparrows, that the value that God has for us is immense. John will tell us that he loved, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the value that he placed on each and every one of us. Matthew uh, 27, verse 9, by contrast, though, 30 pieces of silver was all that they could value Christ at, whom the children of Israel did value. He was only to, worth to them 30 pieces of silver. We need to make sure that he's worth a lot more to us than just the price of a slave. I'm just conscious of time, and we, we've only gotten to value uh, out, of, out of all of our, our list here. So racing ahead, the action was that he, he went and searched. The action that the woman took was that she swept the house. It's interesting that with the father, the action he takes, which is probably harder than going out and searching or sweeping, is waiting. Which again comes back to the idea of receiving sinners. He had to wait for both his boys. And he had to be looking for the opportunities. Sometimes that's the most difficult thing is to be still and to watch and to wait. Um, in uh, Isaiah 50, verse 4, it says, The Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He waketh morning. Uh, he waketh it morning by morning. He waketh my ear to hear as the learned. A word in season is, is such an important concept. To be able to, to be there and to be aware and to value what is lost enough to say that word in season. Sometimes those are hard words to say. But if we've, if we've made ourselves near to that person in the past, and we've built that relationship, and they appreciate the value that we have for them, and they're aware of that, and they value us, it makes saying those words in season so much easier. And we know Ecclesiastes says, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose of the heaven. And, and the father in this parable, he waits that time. He chooses his timing for both conversations, as it were, the one he needs to have with the younger son and the one he needs to have with the older son. 
It's interesting that Ecclesiastes uh, 3, you don't need to, to turn to it, but verse 6 goes on to say, there's a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep, a, to, a time to cast away. And when you think about our, our question earlier, why would the father allow his youngest son to go? He recognized the time of the season. And imagine the pain. In half of it, let him go. That wasn't an easy decision. But it was a wise one. And I think it's important for us to, to realize that the scripture says that there is a time to lose and a time to cast away. Because I think that that has a huge impact on the next part of the process. I stands for information. And I think out of all of the ones, and I'm hoping that you're all still with me, out of all the things in this list, to me, that is the most important one. Because it's the one that we, we neglect the most. Is in every situation, in each of these parables, it, it makes a point to say, and they called their friends and their neighbors. They called their friends and their neighbors. They called their household to a feast. And when you think about what would that have been like? Just take a moment. I know that we're out of time, but I, I, I beg you to just take a moment and think. What was that meal like? You've been invited. Let's say we show up and we've been invited to this, this feast. What's the natural conversation to have happen? Why are we here? Oh, because I lost that sheep. And I found it. And I often think, so we killed that sheep over there to celebrate this one that we found. But I wonder if there's a lesson there. The scripture doesn't put that forward, but it's interesting that Christ will die, that we might be found. And so at this feast, whatever they were eating, the story would have been told because the question would have been, well, where'd you find them? Ah, oh, the other day I was out on the back 40. Counted them, and he, I counted them again, and sure enough, little Billy went missing. And so I set off, and I thought, where would he go? And first I went to the bramble bush. You know why? Because I thought, Murphy's Law, he'll be in the bramble bush. That's what I'll expect. I went there, and sure enough, he was there. Or he wasn't there. And so I thought, man, he's, it's a hot day. Maybe he's gone to look for water. And so I found him down by the stream. And the same could have been told about the woman who was sweeping her, you know? I mean, we've all lost things in our house, our car keys, our socks. And we go hunting high and low. And there'd be some smart person there who will say, I bet you found it in the last place you looked. Because it's always in the last place you looked. And they would have went, yeah, it's true. It's always in the last place you look. What's so important in, in the parable and the point of saying that they're all, all these people are invited? I think it's because they would have shared information. Because when the shepherds would have left that house, they found that their sheep went missing. They would have thought, you know what? I'll check the bramble bush. Or yes, it's a hot day today. Maybe I should start with the stream. In other words, there would have been learning that took place because of the sharing of that experience. That when you lose a coin, check the bottom of the sofa because that's where I found mine. Now, when you think about what we lose in our lives, brothers and sisters, do we tell anyone? If we've lost our relationship with our son or daughter or our parents or our spouse, 
do we tell anyone that it, A, it went missing, or B, that it, it was found? Think of how much we, we, we hurt all those who follow us by not sharing that. Think of how many couples think that they're the only ones who have fights because none of us tell anyone that we have fights. Lynette and I have fights, just so you know. We do. I know, it's hard to believe. I mean, why would there be any arguments in our house? Things go missing in, in my house. And I'm hoping that those of you who are listening, whose children have grown and come and gone, will be able to share with me when my little girls go missing, because they will. I need to know where to look and how to look. You know, I might need a thunk on the head to say, you need to start looking. Because your girls are going missing. Because we know full well how much joy there is when things are found. And so brothers and sisters, we're, we're out of time and there's so much that more could be said but I hope I've encouraged you to, to be aware that these parables cause us to, to take a good look and to see what's missing and to value it, value it enough to do something. Anything is better than nothing. Because it, when we search, when we seek, when we take action, it lets people know, as much as it, we make a mess of it, it lets them know that they're valued. But when we get it back, we need to celebrate that. We need to share that. We need to let other people know that more of us might have causes to rejoice. Thank you.